Super Bowl champions, Eagles fans everywhere, this is for you. Let the celebration begin. Rube, we're into mid-June and the Eagles still haven't signed a veteran running back. That probably means that they might not sign a veteran running back, right? Or it could mean that they're going to sign one as soon as we finish the podcast. Yeah, I mean, if anything would get Howie to make a move, it's definitely the Eagle Eye podcast with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. Uh, yeah, but I, I think it's notable right now that we've heard about um, their interest and, and all that's true, that there is some interest in a veteran running back. But I think one of the main reasons they haven't pulled the trigger is because they really like the guys they have. Yeah, I think... I think what you're seeing, I think part of it's financial, but I think also that they they believe in Boston Scott can be a, an RB2, and I do too. I've been talking him up all off season, uh, probably to the point where Dave's sick of me talking about him. But uh, I saw, and again, it, it's a little it's a little leap of faith to take what somebody did over four games and say, all right, he can do this over 16 games. It's a whole different animal, uh, you know, when when teams have film on you when teams know your tendencies, um, there's a point of diminishing return sometimes. But I, I see a guy who um, is is powerful, is elusive, um, has very soft hands, catches the ball really well, um, has a real kind of sense for the end zone. He finds that goal line. He's got those, those powerful legs that keep churning in, in traffic. Um, and I think he's got a lot of attributes that you look for in a, in a backup running back. And, you know, I know there's that thing of, well, they need a complementary back that's different than Miles, and maybe he's too similar. But you know what? If you have two good backs, uh, that, that's really the main thing. Uh, I think that whole complementary thing, if you have two good players, you, you you know, you go with it. And you can run a lot of the same plays with them. So that that helps. Uh, and they have some other guys that have some some promise, certainly. But I, I think if you, if you go Miles in Boston, I, I think you're in pretty good shape, one and two. Yeah, and Boston – we talked about him a, a lot already as a, a breakout possibility. And we're going to talk about a few more breakout possibilities later in the show. We'll also look at some quarterback performances. And we're going to talk to Jeremy Mathlin, which I know we're both very excited about, get to find out what he's been up to in retirement. Um, but getting back to the running backs, I, I think that you're right. I mean, it starts with Boston. Miles and Boston's a pretty good one-two punch. And – you have to ask yourself if they sign a guy like Freeman or, or Shady, are you willing to take away touches from one of those two guys to give them to a veteran? And I, I don't know if you should be. I, I think one of the, you know, one of the big lessons they learned last year from, from Boston and from Greg Ward is that sometimes you got to roll with the young guys and, and you got to just give them an opportunity. I think there's some validity in that when you talk about miles and Boston and then, you know, Corey Clements, a guy that, you know, a few years ago we were all really high on, and I know injuries have been the reason he hasn't done much in the last couple of seasons. But if he can stay healthy, he can still be a pretty good player. And then after that, you have Elijah Holyfield, who they liked enough last year to bring in at the end of the season. I mean, they didn't have to do that, but they didn't want to miss their chance. And a couple of undrafted players and Michael Warren, who they like an awful lot. And then Adrian Killens, who I think is probably more of a little bit of a project at this point, but I like the idea of rolling with what they have. And uh, I, I guess they're going to be in a situation where they're going to weigh it and, and they're going to see the price. They're not going to spend a, a lot of money. Carlos Hyde got 2.75 million from the Seahawks. I don't think they want to do that. If they can get a shady or Freeman for league minimum, maybe that changes things. But even then, I think you're talking about a third or a fourth running back. Yeah, yeah, I, w I would agree. I think Warren's an interesting guy. I mean, Corey Clement, really, the only thing holding him back has been the injuries. Um, but again, it's been a lot of injuries, and it's been two years of injuries. But anyone who watched the Super Bowl, which is about, what, you know, a billion people, uh, saw what he's capable of doing on, on the on the greatest stage in sports. I mean, those were, those were huge plays. They don't win that game without him. They don't win that game without him. There is no Philly special without his – 55-yard running catch at the end of the second quarter, um, which is terrible thought. <laughs> I mean, if that play never happened, the emptiness in our lives. But uh, you know, I think I think if you, I think they have some some good options, and I think Warren's a really intriguing player, um, the the Cincinnati kid. 
Um, I don't really know a lot about Holyfield. You know, we never saw him, never saw him do anything. So, but they were certainly high on him. So, um, this is a summer of let's get younger. And if, if you go with, I mean, gosh, Corey Clem would be the oldest running back on the roster if, if that's the direction they go. So um, I still think there's a chance they might sign somebody if the prices keep coming down. But I don't think it'll be – I think they want to see what they have in these guys, in these kids. And you know, I think they feel really good about one and two, and they have some options for three and four. And unless something changes, unless they're disappointed with somebody, somebody gets hurt, um, I, think, I think there's a very good chance this is what they're going to go with. Holyfield, not the player, but the situation, kind of reminds me of Boston Scott. You remember a couple years ago, they they signed Boston off the Saints practice squad just for the, I mean, he he returned a few punts, but he didn't play a lot. Almost, I don't think he played at all on offense that year, but they want to just get him in the building and get a head start with him. And it seems like that's what they did with Holyfield too. Um, slightly different situations because Boston was a draft pick and Holyfield wasn't, but same idea that, you know, here's a, a running back they saw something in and they've they've kind of kept tabs on. And, and then when they got the opportunity, they brought him in. Uh, so we'll see. And, and Holyfield, as much as you're kind of right about the complimentary aspect of it, ideally you would have complimentary players, though, and Holyfield or Warren, I think, fit that uh, tough nose between the tackles type of runner that Miles and Boston, I don't want to say they aren't, but they're not that. Um, prototype where I think that Holyfield's a little tougher runner inside and same thing with Michael Warren. So if you have one of those guys to round out your four running backs, that's not bad. And we don't know. Uh, there are some question marks here, but yeah, I think there's a good chance they just roll with what they have and, and you can have running backs find success that aren't superstars. We've seen that before. In this city, we've seen them find late round picks we've seen them find undrafted guys and and turn them into players so the idea that they could do that with holyfield or warren isn't that far-fetched to me could be the next josh adams you just never know (laughs) never know joining us now on the eagle eye podcast this is a treat for us former eagle jeremy macklin jeremy how are you man i'm good man how you guys doing hanging in (laughs) yeah it's good to talk to you. How's how's retirement treating you these days? Uh, retirement's good, man. You know, um, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dad of a 14 month old, and, and um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm teaching. I'm, I should not, I'm not gonna say teaching. I'm actually coaching now at uh, at my alma mater uh, in, in back in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, so, you know, just 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 been doing that, man. Um, you know, I, I, I've been. I thought hard about this uh, just this past um, couple months um, about about football and about kind of what, you know, if I wanted to stay retired and everything. And after talking to my family, I think I think I'm for sure going to going to stay retired. But um, it's definitely a thought that crossed my mind about me trying to get back and, and playing a little bit. But, um, you know, I'm, you know, this is my life now. I'm, I'm happy. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's my it's my job to make this, you know, the best act yet. Um, and I, I'm gonna do my part to become the best father I can be, become the best coach I can be, um, just become the best person I can be. So you know, that, that's kind of that's kind of all that's on my mind now. Can you describe that that inner tug of war between wanting to play again and and you know really kind of because obviously there's a, there's a lot of reasons to want to do it. You're a young yeah. guy, um, but also there's obviously some some pretty compelling reasons not to do it. What's that conflict like inside? I think for me personally, um, I just didn't go out the way I wanted to. Um, you know, I had my worst season um, of my career, my last season. I was banged up. I was hurt. Um, and, and and I think for me, just uh, knowing that, you know, it wasn't it wasn't how I pictured things ending. I think that's the kind of thing that eats at me a little bit. And I think you can you can survey a lot of ex-football player, retired football players. And I think they'll kind of, you know, injuries, a lot of the reasons why people kind of get out the game, you know. Um, so, I think for me, that, that's the most frustrating part, and that's the part that kind of eats at me a little bit. Um, you know, but, you know, when I sit back and I take a step back and I look at everything, uh, I look at my beautiful daughter, I look at my wife, I look at the kind of the, the life that we have now back here in St. Louis, um, it kind of makes things a lot easier to deal with, a lot easier to cope with. And then just understand that your purpose is always bigger than just playing football. You know, even though I love the game of football, I always will. Uh, I just know that I got a, I got a different purpose now. 
What was it like last season? I'm sure there were there were some tough moments watching everyone else play. I mean, what was that first season not in the game like for you? Well, I think technically that would have been my second season. So, sure, yeah. you know, last, I, I think the season before that, I was just banged up. I still have to get surgery on my hamstring. I still haven't gotten that surgery yet. Um, so it, it was definitely tough. You know, I'm talking to LaShawn. I'm talking to some guys in the league. Me and Fletcher are still really close friends. I talk to him a lot. Uh, so it was definitely tough, man. It was definitely tough. And, uh, you know, like you said, it was just uh, knowing that, you know, every part of my body, except for my hamstring, you know, I'm ready to go. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm every part, every, everything else is healthy. Uh, but just knowing that I can't go out there and I can't do it. Um, and then, like you said, just watching people play and just, you know, watching games every Sunday. Um, yeah, it was tough, you know, but I, I had an opportunity last year to, I have a little cousin who uh, is now at the University of Missouri. So it was his senior year in high school. Um, so I had a chance to kind of coach him a little bit. He's a wide receiver. Um, so I think that kind of helped me out a lot, um, you know, mentally kind of dealing with everything. Um, so that, that was pretty cool, pretty cool experience to have. When you look back at your career, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like sometimes you were overshadowed because Deshaun was, was around for a lot of those years. But, um, you know, you're the only player in Eagles history to have five straight seasons with 850 or more yards, um, which is a, a real test. And the year before, I think you had like 760 or something. So real real consistent year, obviously, uh, the one year, Pro Bowl year in 14, back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons. Um, man, some big plays. What, what are you most proud of when you look back at your career, any game, any moment? Uh, I always thought it was kind of, you know, you broke the NFL rookie playoff record with 146 yards, but it came in a game that nobody wants to remember. Exactly, yeah. And then I think uh, DK Metcalf broke that last year, which we won't even talk about. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what do you look back about? Any any moment, any game, any experience that you're most proud of? For me, man, it, for me, it was just staying consistent. You know, that's always been my biggest thing. Um, the consistent players stay around a long, long time. And, and I think that's kind of what I was. Um you know, and, and and I'm proud of the way I carry myself. You know, I you know there's there's always a stigma around you know my position, kind of how people act, kind of how people do things. Um, and I just you know I, I I was just me. Um, you know, and and and, and you know that, that's all you can ask for. Um, but I think just how consistent I was, you know, day in and day out on the football field. Um, you know that 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 that, that was that was it for me. Um, I tell my I tell my guys all the time right now that I coach. Um, you know, a lot of people can be good receivers. Not everybody can be good football players. And that's kind of what I prided myself on, just being a good football player, just being consistent, that's doing the little things on the field, that's, you know, you know, running a route at the correct depth. That's if you have a clear out route, running a route full speed, um, you know, being reliable. You made it, hell, there was games where I didn't get a target all game, and all of a sudden I get a target late in the third quarter. That was just kind of how we did things. That was kind of how to, sometimes that's how the offense falls, you know what I mean? And as a competitor, you always want to touch the football, but – it's always bigger than you. Um, so my big thing is, man, is just it's always staying consistent and staying consistent, um, doing the little things and uh, being the best football player I can be, not the best receiver. Is coaching something that you had thought about before getting into it the last couple of years? I mean, or is that something that was new to you? Uh, it's something I thought about. You know, I, I think it's something I'm, you know, that I'll, that I'll continue to do now. The level I do it at, I don't know. Um, you know, right now, like I said, first and foremost, I want to be a, uh, father to my daughter, um, and um, I, I praise those guys that that coach in college and coach in the league. But uh, the time is just, it's, you know, they, you know, it's, it's a lot of time, right? So my big thing right now is I want to, I want to be a dad first and foremost. Um, and I feel like you know the the best way to do that and also be able to coach is right now at the at the high school level. Um, I've had opportunities to kind of do some stuff at the collegiate level and in the pros, um, you know. But I I think right now that's this is most important. Um, but I, who knows, down the road, you know, once my daughter gets a little older, um, I'm intrigued about, you know, the college and, and, and pro level, you know, coaching there. So we'll see how things go. Well, the Eagles have had five wide receivers coaches in five <laughs> years, so they'll probably have an opening pretty soon. <laughs> no, man, you know, you know what? You know what? You know, funny you say that. I'm, I'm excited about that, that room this year. Um, I'm excited about that room. Um, I'm excited to see the young guys come in and play. I'm excited to see DJ get back out there. I'm excited to see Alshon get back out there. Uh, those guys coming off injury. Um, JJ to kind of, you know, take that next step. You know what I mean? Uh, it's tough, man. It's, it's 
Philly's tough on you. You know what I mean? And 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 um, in a good way, you know, um, I, I love it. You know, I love I love the pressure. Uh, you know, but sometimes it takes people a little bit longer to adapt. I think you know Philly kind of got spoiled a little bit with receivers coming in and having success early. I think D-Jack did, I did, uh, Matthews did, right? We all kind of came in and had success early. Um, and it took it took it took uh, Nelly a little a little bit to get going, but I feel like you know he had some 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 valuable years. And I think I think just give JJ time. I think you give him a little time, and um, hopefully he takes that next step this year. And uh, you know it, it, it's it's different, man. Everybody everybody responds to things a little different. How proud are you of of Deshaun? And you know he's he's grown so much since well, I guess your first year with him was 09, His second year. Um, you know, he's still going at it. Um, he can still run. Obviously, he had some injuries last year, but um, just the leader he's become, um, you know, the uh, the person he's become. Uh, you, you know, you think about, I mean, 2008, 2009 seems like so long ago. He's grown so much as a person. Uh, what, what are your you, – you kind of surprised or proud of him, how far he's come? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just, you know, you, you get to know somebody on a personal level and you kind of see the growth, you know, that that, that, that they have, right? Um, I think for him, I think one of the things was, you know, getting traded from Philly or, um, I'm sorry, getting really, whatever, whatever, the whole chip situation, right? Um, and then kind of, you know, you become a father, right? You become a father and like, you know, that that changes you. And I, I, I mean, I don't know if you guys have kids or not, but um, it, it's something about becoming a dad that just something flips in your head. And you're like, wow, okay. I didn't get this at first, but now I do. Um, and, and, and for Deshaun, I think a lot of times with Deshaun, he was just misunderstood, um, to some people, um, you know what I mean? And I, I, I'm, like I said, I think that's probably something he can probably touch on a little bit better, but, um, you know, just seeing him and seeing the growth of him, you know, from, from, from my standpoint, I, you gotta be proud of him. You gotta be proud of him. And I think that, you know, the thing from Philly and then also becoming a dad, I think those are two big things that, um, probably helped him, you know, get to where he is now. What were those early years like in your career again, a chance to come in the league and you and Deshaun are both young players, exciting players. When you, how do you look back at that time? I, I look back on it a lot, man. You know, I got a, you know, Cully was, Cully sent me, so I have a, I have a disc of all my targets. I got a disc of all my catches. I got a disc of, of, of all that's both camera angles. You know what I mean? So it's kind of cool to kind of look back and kind of see things. And, and you remember a lot of stuff, right? I remember a lot of plays, um, you know, so it's, it's kind of cool to kind of look back on and reflect on that. Uh, it's also kind of cool to kind of see the evolution of what me and Deshaun played in, right? Because you look at what they're doing in Kansas City, right? With Tyreek, McCole, you got Sammy, Kel like that's the evolution of the offense that we kind of played in, you know what I mean? And, and kind of seeing – know, kind of how it's going to new levels. And and clearly you can do a lot of things when you have Patty Mahomes at quarterback, right? Uh, but to kind of see kind of the, the nuances and new different things that they're doing, um, it's kind of cool to say, you know what, you know, I was kind of, you know, we kind of, I was a part of that, you know? Um, and clearly the West Coast goes back way before me, but, you know, you kind of saw some new things with that 2009, 2010 Eagles team with Marty and, and, and Coach Reed doing some different things and some jet sweeps and all that different stuff. And, but now you really see kind of, um, you know, you, you really see those guys getting really creative. And it's, and it's kind of cool to know that, you know, I had a guy I played with and, and we were kind of part of, part of, you know, kind of part of that plan. You're so lucky. You think about, I mean, you played for Big Red, who won a Super Bowl. You played for, uh, you played a year for Harbaugh, who, who won a Super Bowl. You were around Doug. He was an assistant yeah. when he, and he won a Super Bowl. Uh, and then chip, <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> what, 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 I guess two part question, what was it like to see Andy and, and, you know, win a Super Bowl this past year, um, with, with guys that you knew and, and, and know and teammates that you, you were around, um, and what was it like to see the Eagles win a Super Bowl in 17? I think you, you actually almost signed here, didn't you? Yeah, year? you know, yeah, I almost, and I, I talked to you guys when I was in Philly for the alumni thing. Um, you know, I was, I, you know, I don't regret many things, right? And I still don't regret the decision to go to Baltimore, even though, like, in hindsight, like, I, I wanted to come back to Philly so bad, right? I, I it, it was one of those things where, you know, unfortunately, the business side just didn't work itself out. Um, but it 
I don't I don't regret it because if if I'm on that team, who knows what happens? Like right? there's a chance we don't they don't win that Super Bowl. And I thought the city of Philadelphia needed that Super Bowl. I thought there was time, and I thought it, it was such a cool way to watch that thing unfold. Right? It was the underdog. It was the backup quarterback coming in. Um, who you know I love Nick Foles. He's not a backup quarterback at all. But that that was that was how it played out. Right? Um, you know it, it was. You know, kind of, kind of being undervalued, right? That whole team, that whole year, that that team was kind of undervalued a little bit. It was kind of like, oh, well, they're just, you know, they're just hot right now. No, that, that that was to see all that kind of coming coming to light was was really cool. And and to see Big Red win a Super Bowl, I was so happy, man. You know, I texted him after the Super Bowl and just let him know that, you know, I, I was happy and I was I was proud of him and, you know, that hell they 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 they. <laughs> They may be around for quite some years, for years to come, uh, with with the speed and and with that guy on the center, um, and with the masterminds that they have on the offensive side of the ball. Um, they could be around for a long time and, and be um, be contenders in the Super Bowl for sure. Do you have a favorite Big Red story? Yeah. Oh yeah. So this is how I knew what type of person Big Red was. <laughs> My first game we play in Carolina. Right. I'm a rookie. Right. The whole training camp, Kevin Curtis does not play. I mean, does not practice. He's hurt. I'm going with the ones. Me and D-Jack, I'm going with the ones. I'm having a pretty decent camp for a rookie. I come in late. Um, I'm having a pretty decent camp. Right. So I'm I'm thinking against Carolina, I'm going to play. Um, it's, it's funny because that, that game actually was kind of weird. I think we scored on defense once or twice. We had like D-Jack had a punt return. So it was it was a little weird. Like we didn't we put up forty some points, but it didn't feel that way on offense, right? So we get down and and we're beating beating them pretty bad. And um, Big Red comes up to me. He goes, he goes, hey, uh, you ready to go in and block? I was like, go in and block? What, what is he talking about? But like after thinking back on it, I looked at him and he had like this little smirk on his face. So that's how, like, I knew what type of relationship, I knew what type of person Big Red was. And I also understood why he came up and said that to me. Because you have to, you have to, you have to understand situations. You have to, like I say, you have to be a football player, right? And at the situation where four men offense were running the football, hey, I'm getting my starters off the field, Matt go in there and, and go in and block. And that's what he wanted me to do. And I went in there, I blocked my ass off. And I got guys, I got, uh, Who's the corner? Kaysen coming up to me. Hey, man, why you ain't playing? Or I got guys coming in. I'm like, dude, I don't know. So, but then, uh, you know, as the year, as the you know, weeks went on, I, I got in the game more and eventually I was starting by, I think, Tampa Bay game or maybe before that. So, uh, but it, it's crazy how, like, I, like that's that's Big Red in a nutshell right there. Like, that that's him. So, it, it's a pretty cool kind of how that played out. I can just see him saying that. Yeah, that, that little twinkle in his eye. Yeah, uh, that Tampa game was really you're coming out. I think you were six for one forty two in that game. Uh, a yeah. couple touchdowns. Uh, that's when we kind of knew. All right, this guy can play. Um, you know, you were so lucky. You mentioned Nick. I mean, you played with Michael and Alex Smith, Joe Flacco, Mark Sanchez. You played with a lot of really accomplished uh, quarterbacks. Yeah. Um, who who. I don't know what what did what did you kind of and they're all so different. I mean, they're all completely yeah. different type of guys. Um, who did you who did you like playing with the most? Or maybe that's not the fairest way to say it. But who was kind of who did you connect with the most? Who who was your you know who were you most think, comfortable with? I think the connection for me was probably Nick, right? And 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 uh, it's easy for me to say that you know in I think fourteen, right? I had eight hundred through eight games and eight touchdowns, right? So. It's easy for me to say that, but you that goes back to 2012 when Nick comes in and he's playing. He played extremely well as a rookie. People don't realize that. People don't really, like, because the season was kind of, wasn't very good, but Nick came in, he played fairly well. And I think with his toughness and his grit, I think he won the locker room. And, like, ever since then, I didn't get a chance to play with him in, in 13, right? But I think when people saw that, I think that's kind of when he earned the respect from everybody and that's when he earned my respect and him and I just, you know, we stayed at it and he trusted me and I trusted him. And um, I think that's probably why we were able to have that start that we had to the 2014 season. Um, I still think that if he's healthy, I think that's a completely different season. Um, I, I just do. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we won 10 games. I think we might win 12 and 
we're in the playoffs, and that's a completely different story. Uh, but I would say Nick, uh, and that's that's also, that's no knock on any of those other guys. Uh, you know, clearly, you know, Michael was 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 Mike was a was a childhood, you know, icon of mine, like you know, hero of mine. You know, seeing him on the football field, and um, and um, what people don't understand about Alex is Alex is a is a gamer. I I love playing with Alex. Um, I'm, I got the utmost respect for him, uh, but he's a gamer. He knows how to win. He's extremely smart. He's knows where to go with the ball. And I think it's unfair that people labeled him as a, as a game manager or labeled, labeled him as a, as a guy who doesn't take shots because at the end of the day, you can only control what is being called around you. Right. And, 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 and yeah, you, I think everybody can sit up there and say they would like to have seen it go down the field more. But at the end of the day, he, he did what he was supposed to do. He did it extremely at a very high level. And all he's ever done was one, you know what I mean? He lost early in his career, but since then he's he's done nothing but win football games, right? Even when he was at Washington, right? Before he got hurt. I think they were what, six and two, maybe, or something like that. You know what I mean? So he's all he's done is one football game. You know, it's funny you mentioned that 2012 season and and Nick. For some reason, one of my favorite, maybe my favorite touchdown of yours was the one in Tampa. Oh, yeah. Um, in the corner of the end zone, uh, <clears throat> which I think they ruled it incomplete that you were out of the end zone at first and it was a uh, review. And, I mean, that was a lost season. You guys were losing every week. I think that was Andy's last win as Eagles head coach, I think. Um, yeah. It was, was our last win that season. Yeah, it was like a minute left in the game. I've never seen Andy so happy. I mean, it was like, it was such a bad year. You guys had lost like six straight games. He knew he was getting fired. There's going to be a lot of changes. I never saw him so happy until he won the Super Bowl from that moment. Yeah. Um, there was just something special about it. That, that, that year was, was, was tough. You know, because talent, we were talented, right? We were still talented and we yeah. just couldn't, like for some reason, we just couldn't, couldn't win a game. I think we were three and one and we lose in overtime to Detroit, yep. but we were winning in the fourth quarter, late in the fourth quarter. And like, that was, that started the down spiral. And then, um, you know, Wong, I mean, the D coordinator got fired and it just kind of just pulled down effect. And um, yeah, it, it was it was still that that was that's like I played nine that's top three seasons of fun that I had though and it's weird really? because we didn't win very many games but like we never wavered we stuck together um it was tough but like it was it was fun because those guys that were playing I mean we were down DJ Shady got hurt we were down like everybody got hurt that year right but we still were fighting you know what I mean and that that's that's cool man that's that's what it's all about and clearly it's all about winning games but as a player, there's much more that goes into it, um, you know, when you when you go out there and actually play the game. About right after that year, so Andy gets fired and, and Chip's coming in. I know you missed the 2013 season, but what was the whole vibe in the building like during that time? I think immediately after Big Red got fired, I think I think guys were mad, guys were angry, uh, guys were upset. Um, I I don't know if there's a coach in this league that's more respected and more liked than Big Red. Um, I really don't. And and that's not me being biased. That's me just being around a lot of guys in a lot of places, right? Um, and those guys that I've been around, I've been around a lot of places. Um, that seems to be the consensus to, to, to kind of uh, how people feel about him. Uh, so I think immediately people were mad, people were upset. Um, I know me and Shady were pissed. After that team meeting, that we got, oh, we were so mad, um, and I didn't know, I didn't know much about Chip. I knew that Oregon was putting up a lot of points, um, but I didn't know much about Chip. I didn't know much about where he came from. Uh, so before he got there, I was kind of like, kind of whatever about it. Uh, but you know, when he got there that spring and uh, we got into OTAs. Um, you know, you got you got a little little juice, right? You got a little juices flowing, and and clearly, you know, your first impression is always everything, right? So every, you know, he's he's giving it all he got his first impression. So, you know, guys kind of, you know, guys kind of, you know, gravitated towards that something new, something fresh. Uh, but it wasn't until we kind of got, um, kind kind of got into the swing of things to where, you know, the kind of the light got shined on a bunch of the stuff that people have said and a bunch of the stuff that. Uh, people did not take very, very kindly to. So, 
what are you uh what are you going to be doing this uh this fall are you going to still coach uh is it kirkwood you were coaching at yeah so i i guess uh, i guess i don't even know if it's official yet but i don't know if they have announced it but i took the oc job at my high school okay um so you know i guess we're just like everybody else though we're kind of waiting and see kind of what's going to go on um you know as of right now we're slated to start July 6th, um, which is um, a lot later than what we normally would start. We would normally start kind of early June, like like every other high school, but um, and kind of see kind of what the guidelines are and what the rules are and kind of go from there. So I've had to, I've been having Zoom meetings with my guys and I've had to kind of put my playbook together and everything. And it's kind of, it's kind of cool though, because I've, I got some, I got some big red stuff in there. I got some chip stuff in there. I got some stuff that I made up on my own. So uh, it's kind of cool to kind of put it all together. I know you What's got a lot offense of- going to look like. What'd you say? You broke up. What's the offense going to look like when it comes together? Oh man, we're going to put up a lot of points, man. A lot of points. <laughs> hey, listen, they say defense win championships, but defense can't win a championship if the offense scores more points. That's kind of how I look at it. <laughs> I see you as kind of a Marty mad scientist, Marty offensive coordinator type. <laughs> Yeah, but not as headstrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Marty. Hey, Jeremy, I wanted to ask you this. This is something that I saw Tory Smith have a few months ago on Twitter. He was trying to to name the best players he's played with, just in terms of sheer greatness. I'm not going to put you on the spot to, to come up with a finite number, but when you think of just the greatest players you've had the opportunity to, to share a locker room with, who comes to mind? Man. I mean, it's. I'll start. I'll start in Philly, right? We got. I mean, you got LaShawn, right? Who was on the Hall of Fame track. Okay. You got D Jack, who is arguably the best deep ball threat in the NFL history. Okay. You got Fletcher, right? Fletcher Cox. You got Jason Kelsey, Iron Man, right? should be a Hall of Famer, right? You got Jason Peters. I got an opportunity to play with Jason Peters, right? I didn't get to play with this guy in his prime, but people don't know that Trotter came back and played for us my rookie year for a little bit. You know what I mean? So, I granted, it wasn't Trotter that we know Trotter, but I got a chance to play with Trotter, you know? Um, and, then, and then you go to... And I, I, I apologize, I'm leaving out some people, right? But, you know, I got, I got a young Ertz, right? Got a chance to play with the young Ertz. And then you go to KC, okay? You got you got Tyreek Hill, who's probably on the fastest track to a Hall of Fame as, I, as I've ever seen, okay? You got Kelsey, who is on the track to a Hall of Fame, right? You got, I mean, th- those guys, those guys are revolutionizing the game, right? Those guys are, are changing the game. The, the way you have to defend, the way you call plays, those guys are changing the game. Um, and then in Baltimore, I got Suggs in the locker room. Okay. Um, so I've I've had a chance to, you know, chance to play with some pretty, pretty legit players, some pretty good guys. Um, and I mean clearly Mike, you know, for Mike, 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 Mike's like AI, right? Mike did things in the game that has never been done before. Um, uh, you know, now present day, you look at Lamar and kind of what he's doing and stuff like that. But I'm talking about kind of before his time, quote unquote before his time. Um, so I, I mean I I've it's pretty cool, man. And then, and then it's it's also pretty cool to hear those guys talk about you and kind of what you brought to the table and kind of, you know, the type of teammate you were and how talented you were as well. Uh, so that's, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I would, I would say other than me not going out the way that I pictured myself going out, um, I would say that I had a pretty successful career for sure. I think there was a Super Bowl MVP in there too. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's my, <laughs> he's, he's probably my favorite teammate of all time. Really? So, yeah, I, that's that's how much respect I got for Nick, man. Like it, any, it's it's crazy. Like, it's, it's, I got a lot of respect for Nick Foles. Was there anything he did in 2017 that surprised you? No. No. Not not. I mean, he wanted. I mean, I was excited for him. I was happy for him. But surprised me. I'm like, whoa, he couldn't do that, and he did it. No. He he's always been that guy. Um, I think. You know, I think Chicago did an awesome thing by picking him up, trading for him. Um, and that's no knock on Trubisky. I don't know much about Trubisky. I don't, I've don't. i never talked to him. You know what I mean? But um, 
I do know this, that if your team has to rely on Nick Foles, you're in good hands. I can't imagine what it was like for you watching that Super Bowl in 2017, watching Man. the Bulls do that. I was, you know, I, I, I was, I was so happy. I was so happy. Um, you know, part of me wanted to be a part of that team, like I said, and I almost was. Uh, but I was so happy. I was so happy for those guys. Um, so happy for Foles. Um, I was, I was, I was happy for a lot of Fletch Hour. I was just happy for the for the whole organization, for the whole city, man. It was pretty cool. All right, Jeremy, we appreciate your time, man, and Great we stuff. wish you luck on this season coming up. We know that offense is going to score a lot of points. Yeah, man, we got we got to. We got I want to see. I want to see forty eight points a game. I want to see you run it up in the fourth quarter <laughs> on on St. Louis Tech. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I got you. I got you. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Be well. Appreciate it, man. Hey, your NBC Sports Philadelphia podcasts are now on the My Teams app. Listen to Eagle Eye, Sixers Talk, Phillies Talk, and Flyers Talk anytime you want on the My Teams app. That was really fun catching up with Jeremy. Yeah, what a good guy. And I just think, uh, you know, what a what a great player. I mean, he really was. Um, I mean, you know, he, he's in the top 10 in Eagles history in, in catches and yards and touchdowns. And I think, I think he did get overshadowed because – Deshaun, you know, he and Deshaun overlapped for most of their careers here. And Deshaun was just so flamboyant and all the all the big plays. Although, man, you know, Jeremy certainly had his share of of long plays, deep plays, long touchdowns, too. But, you know, he's a quiet And he was guy. explosive, too. He was. That's he the was thing fast. people forget because Deshaun is so explosive. But Jeremy was, I mean, if he was on a different team without Deshaun, he would have gotten credit for being as explosive as he was. He ran a 4-3-1. I mean, yeah. He was fast, so yeah, had a, had a really good career. Uh, it's interesting to hear that he, you know, he talked about thinking, you know, coming out of retirement and playing another year. Um, he's younger than Deshaun, you know. Yeah. So, but yeah, the injuries yeah, just kind of caught up with him. Uh, it's unbelievable. He still needs surgery, you know, a few years after he stopped playing. This game will eat you alive. But it's good to see him and great guy. And uh, I, I don't want to be a defensive coordinator uh, game planning for for Kirkwood this fall. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, the hamstring, it just it sucks for a for a receiver. If if your hamstrings go, there there it goes. And you feel for him uh -oh. that he didn't go get to go out on his own terms, but not many guys do, honestly. You know, it's a it's a game where injuries end a lot of careers and, and he had a good one for sure. He did. Hey, I don't, can you redo that, Dave? You cut out for maybe like three or four seconds. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure for anyone else. Yeah, me too. Okay. Um, okay. Well, uh, like the whole thing, or no? I would say um, it was just the very, very end. Um, like the hamstring stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the the hamstrings are just. It's tough for a receiver if your hamstring goes, then the career kind of goes with it. But he had one heck of a career, and uh, you feel for him that it didn't end on his own terms, but. If we're being honest, a lot of careers end that way. So um, good luck to him in, in coaching. I'm excited to see that offense. Yeah. All right. So we have some breakout players to get to. Uh, wrapping up this series, I, I looked at a total of, of 10 players on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com. One of them today, the story is not even out yet, so we're giving you a little sneak peek. Uh, but we'll start with Josh Sweat, who to me – is one of the most intriguing names on this list because we started to see it last year and he's going to have an increased role uh, unless they sign someone else this season. He's probably going to be the third defensive end. I, I thought, honestly, last year he probably should have gotten a little bit more playing time than Vinny Curry. Um, and Vinny ended up playing a tad more than him. But I like Sweat's chances of at least being a good rotational player for this team. Yeah, I'm not really sure what they have in in Josh Sweat. He's a young guy. He's 23. He was a fourth round pick, so you know they have something invested in him. Um, you know, he had four sacks last year, and um, I, you know he showed some showed some flashes. Uh, he's not going to give you a whole lot against the run. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not sure if he'll ever be, you know, anything more than you know, a situational third down type of guy, but uh, he's got a little something. He's got a little juice, uh, good effort guy. And, uh, and we'll see. He's certainly at a position where there's going to be a lot of opportunities to play. Yeah. And he's an explosive guy. What I really liked, I mean, that rookie season, he played a little bit 
And then they basically halfway through the season, he had an injury and they said, all right, we've seen enough. We'll, we'll kind of redshirt the rest of the way here. It wasn't that serious of an injury, I don't think. Um, but then that off season, he put on like 18 pounds. Uh, and whenever a guy makes a, a big body change like that, you wonder if he's going to be able to keep that explosiveness. And I think he was. And now that you, you have a year with that weight and kind of learning how to play with it, I think there's a lot, a lot of room for potential and growth for Josh Sweat. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's gonna be interesting to see. He played a lot. He played like 30 snaps a game last year. Um, you know, it's interesting. He he, I don't know if he made the impact. And again, he's a young guy, and and we'll see. But uh, let's see. He played. Um, yeah, he played about 40 fewer snaps than than Vinny. Um, they were about as productive. Um, you know, it was a, I, I, I know that Jim would like to play his third uh, outside rusher more than those two guys played. I think, you know, I mean, BG and Derek Barnett both played 70 to 75% of the snaps. I, I'm sure he'd like that to get a little more balanced. Um, and, and Sweat's going to have the opportunity to do it. I, I just don't know what they have in him. We'll see. He's, he's got a shot. Can he be an eight-sack guy? Yeah, six to eight-sack guy. Uh, he's got a shot. Who does he remind you of, just from a body standpoint? He, like, I, when he walked in the locker room the first day, you go, man, that guy looks like Javon Kurse. Yeah, I thought I, I always thought um, Derek Burgess. Okay. Um, but, yeah, he's got that frame. Um, well, Javon Kurse gave, gave the Eagles six to eight sacks. <laughs> he, just got, <laughs> he just got paid a lot more than Josh yeah. Sweat did for it. Um, but, yeah, he's got that. He's got that frame, uh, you know, basketball player-looking guy. And, uh, you know, he's, he's an interesting name. The next one has really become a fan favorite, Greg Ward. Um, what a great story he was last year, the perseverance and, and coming back. And, and the question with Greg Ward is, all right, is that where the story ends? Was he a nice story in 2019? He made some plays. Or is this guy a legitimate player in this offense going forward? Yeah, he is. Uh, 28 catches in, in the last six games. <laughs> I mean, um, he was not, you know, you project that over a season. He's got, you know, over 70 catches. Uh, I'm not sure he'll catch 70 passes because obviously, you know, the situation with wide receivers was so dire last year that, uh, but I think the thing you saw with Greg Ward was as soon as he got out there, there was such a trust level between Carson and, and Greg. And there was such a, a chemistry and a connection. I think his first game, that he played was his first NFL game, other than a couple, you know, a snap or two. He caught like six passes, and he he's he can't run like you know, I mean he's probably the slowest receiver on the team, but he gets open. Uh, he just he has a real feel for getting open. He's got great hands. Uh, I you know I guess there's a little Jason Avant in him. He's not as um, yeah. I, I think that's probably a good comparison. You know, Jason Avant was one of the slowest receivers at the combine, and. You know, he had a really nice career. He'd get you 34, you know, 30, 40 pa you know, catches a, a year in the slot. Uh, you know, not a lot of big plays down the field. But on third and six, man, you know, where are you looking? You're looking to Greg Ward or Jason Avant, Greg Garrity, those kind of guys. You know, there's one for the, for the, old, for the old heads in the, in the crowd. Greg Garrity, trash from Penn State. You know, the, that, that is such a, a key position because on third and six, you know, you you don't need a guy to get you twenty yards. You need a guy to get you six yards. And Greg Ward will do that every time. And and I think I think Carson just has that trust level, knowing that you know Greg. And I think it took him a while to really transition and learn the nuances of wide receiver after being a quarterback in college. Um, you know the the route tree. He hasn't mastered. He he'll he'll run if the if the route says six yards and two feet and three inches he's running six yards and two feet three inches and for a quarterback that's huge he knows exactly where he's going to be and and for the quarterback to have that trust level is is you know he's not running 10 yards on a on an eight yard pattern he's running he's running eight yards and the quarterback knows it every time and that's that's big yeah i think back to that washington game you know the touchdown was that that's carson having trust that you're going to come down with that football and i remember when he made that catch we both looked at each other and said, no one else in this team would have made that catch right. at that point, you know? And, um, and it wasn't just that catch he had on that drive. He had four catches for 40 yards. So in, in crunch time of a must win game, 
they turn to him. And I, I don't know if if he's ever going to become a Pro Bowl type player, but um, a breakout season for Greg Ward could just be re- remaining consistent and being that. Um, that solid option for Carson Wentz. And with how much speed this team brought in, you got to think that Greg Ward and Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, the guys who work the middle of the field, are going to have some opportunity this year. Yeah, and playoff game against the Seahawks. What, who did Josh McCown start looking for? <laughs> right when he got in the game, Greg Ward. Um, he's a valuable to be fair, guy. He didn't know who the other guys were. <laughs> uh, Greg Ward's, yeah, I mean, Josh is old enough to be his dad, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I I like Greg Ward. I think he's he. I, if I was a quarterback, that's the kind of guy I would want to throw to. All right, the next one is gonna bring some eye rolls, but it shouldn't. Uh, it's JJ or Sega Whiteside, and I, I know that uh, I know that the rookie season didn't go the way anyone expected. But look, he, he's a second year, second round pick. If you're doing a list of breakout players, he has to be on it, and. Um, I don't think the Eagles have given up on him. I, I think that they probably look at him and say, we can't rely on him, but there's a reason he was a second round pick last year. Well, if they thought they could rely, rely on him, they wouldn't have taken Jalen Rager in the first round. Uh, yeah. And he, he's got some traits, but you know, he's got to be a guy who he's got to catch everything when, when you don't have, you know, electrifying speed and your whole thing is size and, and wingspan and hands. Um, you got to catch the ball when, when you get your opportunities and, and he didn't do that. And that was the most alarming thing. He's not going to, he's not going to outrun you. You know, he, he's going to go up and get it. And, and he has to do that when he gets, when he gets his chances. Yeah. And we still don't know the extent of his injuries last year, but I think we all kind of understand that they were a little more significant than, maybe what we knew during the season. And so you start to wonder how much did that play a role? It was a foot injury. So if if he's this basketball type receiver who goes up and catches the ball and your foot's really messed up, yeah, I mean, that could, and I don't want to make a ton of excuses for him, but I think that's probably a valid one, at least at some level. Yeah, we'll see. You know, we'll, we'll see. I, I know it was bothering him. I know he didn't want to use it as an excuse and, uh, but yeah, this is this is a big year for him. What do you expect from him? That, that's that's the million dollar question. I don't think he can expect a ton. But um, we kind of heard Jeremy Macklin talk to us about um, playing in this city, and that's a, a big deal. Is that you know it there there was a lot of criticism, and right, right rightfully so. He was a second round pick that didn't perform well, and there were guys drafted behind him who did. And and he's always going to be compared to guys like DK Metcalf and, and Terry McLaurin. So um, I think that's a big part of this. If he can be headstrong enough to not let that affect him, it'll go a long way because he can't come into the season with a defeatist attitude. That's for sure. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, I think it did get to him a little bit last year uh, and that's natural. I mean, I, you know, I think we've talked about this before, but I do think he, he put a lot of pressure on himself. He tends to over, he's a very smart, thoughtful kid which sometimes can be you know a, a negative you know you because he you know he, he really always started to overthink things and you know he wanted think to about do, nelly yeah 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 you, you want really dumb guys who aren't gonna you know <laughs> not gonna be in their own head so much me go catch football exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm not gonna say it but yeah <laughs> that's what you're looking for <laughs> and, but it, it is notable that J.J. right now is down in Houston catching balls from Carson Wentz. Yeah. We talked about how much it means for Jalen Rager, but J.J. hasn't played a ton with him either. So um, that could be a big deal. Yeah. Who, who do you think Who do you think is going to catch the most passes this year out of Eagles wide receivers? <sighs> Gosh. Um, Josh you've asked this say. before, and I, I think and I said – yeah, I try to avoid. You, you'll notice how I avoided the uh, the whole JJ question you asked me about expectations. Um, I, I think that we we talked about this before, and I I mentioned Greg Ward. Um, it could be anybody. It could be anybody, and, and that's as much talent as we think they have a receiver. It's raw talent, and there are a lot of question marks. And I have no idea. <laughs> we we know that Zach Ertz is probably going to lead the team in catches, but receiver wise. I guess Greg Ward's your best bet. Wow. You know, Deshaun's never going to have a, a ton of catches. He's going to make big catches. He's right. never going to um, – but he could. Caught I mean, 86 he has, one year. Yeah. 
Um, after that, we don't know what Alshon is going to do. <laughs> he, I mean, JJ, you have no idea. You have no idea about the rookie. I guess Greg Ward's the safest bet, or him or Deshaun. Interesting. So one guy who was hurt all year and is 33, another guy who was on a practice squad. <laughs> but you're right. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's an impossible question to answer. I'd probably go Greg Ward just by default. Yeah. All right. So you did a, a fun exercise. You looked at the 10 best Eagles quarterback performances and the 10 worst. Where do you want to start here? Yeah. So the goal was to find the 10 best and 10 worst single game performances. Um, and it was really, it was really fun. It was hard to, it was hard to narrow it down. Um, I didn't rank them. I, I just listed them chronologically, but, um, you know, and it's interesting. I got a few people that complained that I didn't include uh, Ron Jaworski's performance in the NFC championship game in 1980 that they won, but he was, he was, he was like, you know, eight for 31. I mean, he was two interceptions. He was terrible, but, um, you know, some of them, these are, some of these are recent. I, I, I think to me, probably the worst one ever was Pat Ryan. Um, in, in 1991, that was the year the Eagles had the best defense of uh, ever. Um, Jim McMahon got hurt early in the game. Pat Ryan had just come out of retirement. He's working construction. Uh, Cotype brought him in. Randall was out for the year. Uh, and the Eagles were at RFK Stadium. And Pat Ryan, <laughs> he threw 14 passes, uh, three completed to the Redskins, four to the <laughs> Eagles for 24 yards. There was one point where the Eagles had a wide receiver named Kenny Jackson, who was a complete complete first round bust, uh, Penn State wide receiver. And uh, Daryl Green is covering him. It was a key moment in the game when Pat Ryan threw to <laughs> Darryl, threw to Kenny Jackson with Daryl Green covering him in, <laughs> in the end zone. And Daryl Green picked it off. I think Daryl Green had two picks that game. And Andre Collins had one uh, from Cinnamonson. Remember Andre Collins? Yeah, he I do not. Them off. But that was – people still – Eagles fans still have nightmares – uh, about that game. Pat Ryan's uh, passer rating was 0 0.00. One of, one of the only times since 1951 an Eagles quarterback has had a, a passer rating of zero in a game. So that was probably the worst. Now the best, you know, I mean, you could certainly go with one of about nine Nick Foles games, the NFC Championship game, the Super Bowl. He did have an interception, but it was a ball that Alshon batted up in the air that got picked off. It was it was one of his best throws of the game, really one of the best throws of his life. Uh, I mean, you know, a lot of these were against the Redskins. Uh, you know, Michael Vick, man, that game he had down at FedEx Field in 2010, 20 for 28, 333 yards, four touchdowns, and he ran for 80 yards on eight carries. Uh, but one of my favorites is uh, it was in 1954, a guy named Adrian Burke threw seven touchdowns. He was the first quarterback in NFL history ever to throw seven um, touchdowns. He's still one of only seven to do it, including Nick in Oakland um, in 2013. Um, but he also completed 70% of his passes. To this day, Dave, the only quarterbacks in NFL history to complete 70% of their passes and throw for 70 touchdowns are Adrian Burke of the Eagles against the Redskins and Nick Foles of the Eagles against the Raiders in the whole history of the game, which is pretty cool. And the crazy thing is, Adrian Burke only threw like 13 touchdowns that year, but seven of them were in one game. Uh, it was a total anomaly. He only threw like 30 in his career. He was a punter. He was mainly a punter. He's actually punted uh, more than anybody in Eagles history, Adrian Burke. But um, I don't want to get too far straight. But, uh, yeah, so I, I think that was it was such an anomaly, such an outlier back then in the 1950s when passing games weren't – yeah, they weren't designed to, you know, to have high volume, uh, you know, production. So, uh, but it, it, it was interesting to do and kind of take a look back at some of those games I covered back in the 50s. And, and uh, thank you. It took me I was a while. biting my tongue the whole time. It, that's called a preemptive strike. Um, <laughs> it took a while to find my steno pads from, from you know, the mid 50s, but I, I finally found the box in the garage. They were just tablets with stone etchings. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking I love, those on the side of the cave. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part about these lists that you did was you made it harder on yourself for no reason. Yeah, like you limited it to one game per quarterback. And I asked you why, and you said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I just wanted to have more guys represented because it can, then it can just turns into Donovan and Foles. The whole list is Donovan and Foles. Um, so I wanted to kind of, you know, get some other guys in there. Um, a couple guys were on both lists which is interesting. Uh, Norm Sneed made both lists. Donovan made both lists. 
and I believe Bobby Thomason uh, made made both lists. So okay, uh, yeah, maybe I'll do running backs in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, you play long enough, you're probably going to make both lists. Yeah, that's true. If I did wide receivers, yeah, I should. Uh, that's, that's How are you going to do that? Just zero? Like no catches? Well, yeah. Mac. Mac Collins, Mac Collins, Mac Collins, Mac yeah. Collins. <laughs> he was doing his job, Ruby. Great at that well. Probably Nelly um, might make that list too. Possibly. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening. We thank Jeremy Macklin for joining us. That was great stuff and great to hear from him. If you enjoy the Eagle Eye podcast, please do us a favor, rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back with you next week. Everyone have a good weekend.